the Hive Think Tank. Where are you joining us from today? I would love to know. We are so excited for today's special event. We are joined by a panel of experts in fintech, and we're going to be talking all about how digital banking is changing everything um, and how that's been accelerated by the pandemic. And our panelists are from all over the world today. So we are expecting and anticipating that you guys at home are also from all over the world, and we would love to know where. So just go ahead and drop your location in the chat. Okay, we've got some uh, Bay Area folks. I, I would hope so, I would hope so. Okay, great, awesome. So we're gonna go ahead and get started here. I'm gonna really briefly talk about uh, the ground rules for today before I tell you guys what the Hive Think Tank is. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and pass the virtual mic over to Tim Robbie, the Hive's managing director and founder. My name is Maddie Watt. I am the manager of people and programs at the Hive. And one of the main things that I oversee is the Hive Think Tank. The Hive Think Tank is our ecosystem of entrepreneurs, corporations, and thought leaders. We are bringing you events in the form of um, AI sort of thought tracks, 5G, um, all sorts of things related to very high tech things. And we are bringing you content in the form of events as well as published pieces on Medium. So if you want to follow along with the Hive Think Tank, you need to go ahead and follow us on Meetup. I'm gonna drop the links for all of those things in just a couple of minutes. Um, and as we're gonna go ahead and get started, we want you guys to ask our panelists questions. So when you do that, please use the Q&A button. The button is located below all of the video screens. Right down there, there's a little button that says Q&A. So when you click that, um, it will let you guys ask a question in there. It's in one nice place for our moderator and it lets you guys upvote different questions too. So please ask questions. We love questions. And this session will be recorded and sent out to everyone later. So those are the ground rules. Um, this is the Hive Think Tank. Welcome aboard if you are new and if you are returning, thanks so much for coming back. And we want you guys to sign up for our future events. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop those links below into the chat. And Robbie's just gonna flash those events on screen. Awesome, thank you. And thanks to our sponsors. So we've got a digital twins event coming up. Um, that's going to be really exciting. We're partnering with Tipco on this. Um, Kamesh, our, our dear friend and, and chief uh, product officer of The Hive, who's today's moderator, will also be helping out with that event. So stay tuned for that. And I will send the registration link. And then the next slide, Robbie, please, is our very exciting event about the emerging space economy. So that's going to be in the very first week of May. I will drop that as well. That's in partnership with Astro Labs. We're super, super excited to be bringing you guys these events. And we have more that are in the can. We just haven't been able to release them yet. So you need to make sure that you follow along and join the Hive Think Tank so you can stay up to date on all of our events. Without further ado, here is TM Robbie. Thank you, Maddie, and, and thank you for putting this event together. So today is a, is a special event because we, we have a global representation and we'll, we'll talk more about this. So the Hive is a global entity. We have entities in, in Brazil, in the US, Kamesh, uh, Everson in Brazil, Kamesh in the US. Uh, we have a colleague who couldn't join today from, from India. And we have Sharil and Haizam from Southeast Asia. And, and very soon, we'll be establishing a hive for the MENA region based in Saudi Arabia in collaboration with Saudi Aramco. And uh, next year, a hive in Europe in collaboration with the EIF, which is the European Investment Fund. So, so uh, the hive is an early stage venture capital entity. It is a particular subclass of venture capital that's called a venture studio. And we are very focused on the multi-decade long transformation of a variety of different industries, leveraging data, leveraging uh, various digital approaches and technologies that, that you see on the bottom. This is our focus in the US. Um, different regions have different domain focus. So um, I'll, 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 I'll say a word about the Hive Brazil has had a very heavy focus on FinTech and financial services. 
whereas the hive in Southeast Asia has been very focused on the broad digitalization of the Southeast Asian economy, including fintech and, and other areas. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce my colleague in, in the Southeast Asia, uh, Sharil Ibrahim. Thank you, Ravi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us uh, for a Hive Think Tank. Um, uh, the Hive Think Tank, as you might have heard from Matty, is a way for us to build uh, the, our community and also a way for giving back to the community in terms of uh, knowledge sharing. Um, I'm one of the managing partners of Hive Southeast Asia. We're the newest uh, member of the Hive family. Hive's been around since uh, 2012. <laughs> And um, in, in the US, it's, um, um, it's on its fourth fund. Uh, as Ravi might have mentioned, uh, we are a venture builder and also an early stage investor. And um, in Malaysia, uh, we're, in Southeast Asia, we're looking at specific sectors, um, in particular, agri-tech, edu-tech, fintech, uh, government transformation, and healthcare. And all this is powered by, um, the, the opportunity for AI and data to transform enterprises. Um, we, we, uh, we, are, we are just starting up and we're one of the Panjana uh, reward uh, recipients. And um, part of this event is to show the, also the global collaboration between all the different hives and uh, uh, the knowledge uh, that can be shared between uh, in, in this global footprint. Um, without further ado, let me introduce Kamesh. Kamesh is uh, one of the partners in Hive Silicon Valley and also the chief product officer of the Hive. And, um, and uh, he'll be bringing an interesting and exciting panel on global fintech with digital banks. Kamesh. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Sharon. Welcome, everyone. This is really an exciting event for us, given how global it is. Um, in fact, uh, looking at all the locations uh, popping up here, um, I feel like I'm cruising on the International Space Station, uh, like the picture that uh, Matty showed uh, <laughs> about our upcoming uh, space economy event. Um, the reason uh, why we're so global is because of the nature of the topic uh, that we're going to discuss about today, which is how digital banking is going to impact the global fintech industry. Um, we strongly believe that much like how the internet impacted the global media industry or the global communication industry from post offices to emails. Uh, we believe digital banking will have the same type of far reaching, extremely global impact uh, on the entire banking industry. Uh, but unlike the internet, which took uh, about 30 years to reach half of the world's population, we believe digital banking will reach a much broader proportion of the global population in an order of magnitude less amount of time. Um, and therefore, we believe that digital banking could be far more intense in its destructive power than even the internet that we have seen unravel over the last 30 years. Um, and, and therefore, to discuss uh, you know, this type of a, a disruptive global topic, uh, we have put together a, a truly global uh, panel uh, of uh, leading uh, industry experts, entrepreneurs, and, and investors uh, who are all very intimately working with the uh, fintech world uh, and, and deeply understand and appreciate the impact of digital banks uh, all around the world. So please join, in, uh, join me to introduce uh, our, our panel um, of, of uh, esteemed uh, experts. Um, I'll just go ahead and, and briefly introduce the panel and, and allow them to uh, say a few words about what they're doing and, and also uh, uh, have a uh, uh, kind of a, uh, have some opening comments on this topic. Uh, but before I do that, uh, I want to urge the audience members uh, to share with us on the chat panel um, some of their early experiences engaging with digital banks, uh, particularly uh, features of digital banks that have uh, impacted them positively, which they like to use, uh, could be payments, could be remittances, could be money transfer, um, uh, could be lending or borrowing if they've done that digitally. Uh, personally, for me, uh, I've uh, particularly liked the way remittances have worked, especially cross-border remittances, uh, particularly from the US uh, to other countries like India, um, and the way the access to international banks has been made so seamless just through a simple mobile app. Um, I personally use the Bank of America mobile app, uh, and I like the 
the way it integrates into other countries kind of banking system and banking codes um, i've also uh, been exposed to the indian uh, digital uh, banking uh, kind of uh, growth um, and particularly in india there is a, a payment uh, consortium called the uh, national payment corporation of india which is a consortium of banks along with the central bank um, which has pretty much standardized and normalized uh, the authentication part of digital banking uh, by using the national social security identifier called Aadhaar in India, uh, which is quite disruptive the way uh, it has been organized by the central bank with a lot of participation from the banking industry. Um, so please uh, do share uh, your experiences with digital banks. Um, I will read out uh, uh, the comments as we, as we go through this panel. Uh, without uh, further uh, ado, uh, uh, happy to uh, and a pleasure to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have today with us uh, Nason Munaswamy, uh, who is the co-founder of uh, Money Match uh, from Kuala Lumpur. Uh, we have Everson Lopez, who Ravi introduced earlier, who is the managing director of the Hive in, in Brazil. Uh, we have Yuen Tak Siu, uh, also known as YT, uh, who is the CEO of a, of a startup called uh, Jernexu uh, in Kuala Lumpur. Um, and we have uh, Mike Walsh, uh, who, is, uh, who is the managing partner uh, of a fund uh, called Greenweiser Capital. Um, so I'll hand it over to the panelists uh, to give uh, brief introductions and their opening comments. Uh, also, please do answer the uh, question that I posed uh, about your favorite uh, kind of features uh, and experiences using digital banks. Uh, so maybe we can, we can start with uh, Nason uh, and then Everson and, and then YT and Mike. Um, Nason. Uh, Thanks very much for the introduction, Tamish. Uh, good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon, depending where you guys all are. Uh, over here, it's nice early in the morning on April Fool's Day here in Malaysia. Uh, my name is Nisan. I'm one of the co-founders of Money Match. Uh, we're basically a multinational remittance firm. Uh, we, but we primarily specialize in B2B payments. We do that in Malaysia, in Australia, in Brunei, uh, and coming over to Singapore and Hong Kong soon as well. Um, my own background, I was actually an investment banker for most of my life, starting up in Malaysia, then I went out to Singapore uh, and even worked in Hong Kong. Uh, and my primary focus has always been on actually foreign exchange and currency swaps and whatnot. So it's actually an extension of what I was doing, uh, bringing institutional level FX pricing down to the retail and the SME level, to make a long story short. Uh, that's what we're doing over here in Malaysia uh, right now at the moment. Uh, in terms of my favorite features um, for digital banking, obviously here in Southeast Asia, it's still a very nascent and young industry. So we don't have any really real examples to look at. But uh, personally, what I find really, really interesting, because I do a lot of spend a lot of time researching about uh, the different features uh, of digital banking, is actually this new uh, Spanish new bank. It's the first ever uh, Spanish ever challenger bank called Rebellion. And they have a really, really cool location intelligence system, whereby as the youngsters walk around and they actually tag that along with the different, different merchants and they even uh, integrate that with even like Instagram as well. So it's a really snazzy new way of doing banking. It's super targeted at like 16 year olds to 25. They aren't even targeted at the older age. And I think it's just a brilliant way of bringing about a new age of neo banking. Uh, and it's brilliant to see that in Spain. Uh, so yes, yeah, so that's just my comments from my side. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan. Uh, Everson, you want to go next? Sure. Um, so uh, I don't know if I say good morning, good evening, but uh, it's, it's, it's good to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Uh, I'm glad we are doing this global conversation. I'm in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's still March here. It's the 31st of March, 11 p.m. And um, yeah, uh, my name is Everson. Uh, I'm the founder and, and, and the managing director of The Hive in Brazil. We started The Hive in Brazil uh, on late 2016. Uh, I have a career mostly on internet and, and being uh, investing in financial companies, uh, you know, back then. And uh, through the Hive Brazil, we are being, as Javi mentioned early on, heavily focused in bringing the best of AI and data to uh, create what we call the new financial industry. And that is the uh, emerged in the form of a portfolio of companies that we invest, have created. And in some cases, I ended up leading the company uh, as a CEO uh, from investments uh, type of, of business, payment business, uh, data intelligence for you know, financial business. And uh, in one of the companies that we could create, we create a bank from scratch because as we look to the market and we look to partner with the bank, we saw that it would be much easier we create our own bank, get our own license and develop the, you know, the cloud vision of open bank and, and build the, the banking from the future without any legacy. Uh, and it was a great experience and happy to share more about uh, here during the chat. 
Awesome. Thanks, Everson. Uh, Whitey, you want to go next? Great. Thanks, Kamish. And uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to the host for having me. Um, yeah, my name is YT. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Genexu. Um, I founded the business uh, nine years ago now, and our core business is essentially online financial comparison uh, for banking and insurance products. Essentially, it's you know e-commerce uh, for banking and insurance. Um, we were a very simple uh, goal or vision, which is to enable a consumer to just pick up their phone um, and get access to all their basic uh, personal finances at any time, uh, anywhere. Uh, my background, I started my career, I also started my career at an investment bank, I spent a bit of time uh, in a hedge fund and then uh, in a family business uh, in traditional media. Um, what's my favorite, what am I most looking forward to uh, from digital banking? I think as Nathan mentioned, you know, we don't really have, uh, we don't have digital banks in Malaysia yet. Um, but one, you know, one, I guess, very simple thing, which I, I really do look forward to is just being able to see all of my personal finances, you know, in one place, right? So uh, it's a lofty, it's a lofty goal, because that would mean, you know, all the ecosystem players would need to have APIs, it would mean everyone would have to be integrated. Uh, but I just wish I could just, you know, pick up my phone and see all of my banking, credit, uh, insurance, investments, all in one place without having to switch, constantly switch apps and websites. Um, so that's something which I'm very much looking forward to. Awesome. Thanks, Whitey. That reminds me of uh, TikTok for personal fans. Maybe there's a startup idea of that. Mike, uh, you want to go next? <laughs> yep. So I'm uh, Mike Wallace, general partner at Greenvisor Capital. We're a Silicon Valley-based venture capital firm focused exclusively on early stage fintech. Uh, the firm's been around since uh, 2013. Uh, we're now investing out of our third fund. Uh, we do have a global mandate. Uh, we've invested in 40 portfolio companies, uh, majority of them in the United States, but we do have a portfolio company in Africa, uh, India, Latin America. So we do take a, a very much global approach. Uh, our firm has a number of uh, strategic uh, LPs ranging from insurance companies to banks, um, to payments companies, to systems integrator uh, data companies. Uh, and then we, we have a very broad approach to fintech that includes uh, the obvious fintech investments like payments and uh, and lending and, and digital banking to uh, less obvious things that are focused on data um, and that sit at the intersection of uh, kind of broader technology trends and financial services. And it, as far as my favorite um, digital banking product, maybe because I've used traditional products for so long and I spend so much time looking at um, you know, the, the latest, greatest digital banking product. Um, none of the kind of just moving stuff to the, to the cloud or to mobile uh, gets me all that excited. Uh, so I'm going to go a little further out on the risk spectrum. Um, you know, we have a portfolio company called uh, Dharma Labs that's described themselves in many different ways, but one of them is a crypto bank. You know, what would the bank of the future look like built on blockchain? Uh, and what intrigues me about um, that business is and businesses like that is that I feel like I'm getting a look into the future. Um, and you know, they're just, them and other uh, DeFi companies are basically displacing traditional financial in intermediaries uh, with a peer-to-peer -peer model uh, with a smart contract in the middle. Um, and it's just really interesting to see what types of really uh, completely new products can be built uh, in that model. So uh, you know, many of these things are still many years away from being kind of broadly globally ready, but uh, that's just a lot more exciting rabbit hole to fall down than, uh, you know, something that's just a better mobile experience. Absolutely. Thanks, Mike. And uh, particularly the whole notion of crypto bank, uh, I feel there is an opportunity to create a, a structure where as interest, instead of getting fiat or cryptocurrencies, you get energy, uh, could be a Tesla power pack or your utilities bill. Uh, given the relationship between energy and mining cryptocurrencies. Uh, so definitely fascinating. Thanks, Mike. Sure. So we're very fortunate to have such an esteemed panel uh, with us today. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, all your panelists, for joining us today, uh, despite being uh, uh, quite late uh, your time, uh, especially uh, both Everson and Mike. Uh, really appreciate uh, your participation in this panel. Um, uh, so please do uh, continue to uh, chat along. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm seeing all the chats coming. Uh, Sanjeev here talks about the challenges of uh, interbank clearing. Uh, so that is reference to the comment I made about the payment uh, system that uh, evolved in India, uh, which is quite advanced uh, compared to other uh, clearing uh, payment systems in the, in the world. 
Um, uh, also, feel free to post questions on the Q&A, like Matty mentioned earlier. Uh, so we want this to be an interactive session with all the uh, audience members out here. Um, uh, so, so kicking start the panel conversation, uh, the news of the hour uh, is the launch of the digital banking system in Malaysia, uh, which is obviously an important economy, not just in ASEAN, uh, but overall in, in Asia. Um, and, and we would love to discuss this topic, uh, you know, what is going on uh, with the central bank and this new reform, regulatory reform in Malaysia. Uh, what does it mean to the Malaysian economy? What does it mean to the ASEAN and, and the wider uh, Asian and global economy? Um, so to uh, uh, enlighten us more about this new change and, and how it's being perceived, uh, I'd like to start with uh, both YT and, and Nason, uh, who can give us uh, their insights uh, from Malaysia uh, and then move over to Everson and Mike, uh, who can comment about uh, typical kind of evolution of digital banks in, in various types of economies and, and their experiences with that. Um, so look forward to kicking this conversation with this topic. Um, maybe Vaiti, you can begin, and, and then Nathan, you can uh, you can add uh, kind of your comments, your observations uh, about this kind of thing. Sure. Uh, thanks, Hamish. So I guess just to give a, a bit of context around um, what's happening in Malaysia. So, you know, our, our regulator, uh, Bank Negara, uh, is currently going through the process of taking applications uh, for up to five new digital banking licenses, uh, which they aim to issue by the start of 2022. Um, now, what's significant uh, about this uh, for our market is that, you know, Malaysia is a market where we only have around 20 to 25 active licensed uh, banks, and it's very, very rare. Uh, for banks to be uh, bought and sold, it's, it's very, very rare for new uh, banking licenses. So, the you know, the fact that we have not just uh, new banks but new digital banks coming uh, coming on board is uh, should really be a game changer. Um, and I, you know, what I I suspect um, a topic or a recurring topic in today's discussion. I think Everson mentioned it briefly, is that you know the tr you know traditional banks struggle with innovation and digitization. Um, not because they don't want to do it, right? But actually, a lot of the times, because uh, you know, traditional infrastructure, processes, regulation actually make it very difficult for innovation. Um, so the fact that we've got five new uh, digital banks uh, with no legacy, right, that really can be built bottom up as digital first businesses, um, really is uh, will be a game changer, right, for our local ecosystem. Awesome. Thanks, Vaiti. Uh, Nason. Sure, sure. Uh, just echoing uh, YT's comments as well. This is quite a game-changing event. Um, Malaysia, like a few other Southeast Asian countries, are very protected uh, financial ecosystems. It is very difficult to get licenses, whether is it even in banking or even in payments, for example, as well. Uh, a lot of countries even have like uh, local ownership requirements and whatnot. But that's the general scene here in Southeast Asia. Uh, so to see Malaysia making such an aggressive bold step forward as well uh, and licensing out uh, five new digital banking licenses to target our population of about 32, 33 million, uh, it is really, really interesting. There are a lot of different aspects, I think, right now uh, that Benegada is actually doing relatively well because of the, they really need to, it's a tough juggle uh, between innovation versus sustainability, I would say. Uh, and that's actually one of the key points that we actually see here in the Malaysian aspect of digital banking whereby the regulator insists upon the profitability plan as well. Uh, because Malaysia still is a generally young-ish nation when it comes to financial services maturity, as compared to, let's say, Hong Kong, even in the Asian context, or India, for example. Uh, so with that in mind, the regulators are generally a bit protective. Uh, what they do not want to see are obviously cases of digital bankings opening up and closing off within just two or three years. And now, of course, they're citing certain examples in Australia. This doesn't work particularly well uh, when it comes to the regulator's mindset. So it really is about that juggling between innovation and sustainability. Uh, but nonetheless, it's really, really very exciting times. And I think that the five players will be coming in eventually. will probably be fairly large uh, digital ecosystem players who really, will be able to add a lot of value uh, to what the traditional banks in Malaysia just aren't covering at all. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Uh, Mike and Everson, uh, while you chime in, I also want to uh, pile up a nuance that uh, YT pointed out between a pure digital bank uh, and a traditional bank that has also built a digital interface. Um, so, so Mike and Everson, as you comment about um, digital banks in, in various different economies and how they're evolved, uh, would also appreciate your insight on this distinction between pure digital banks um, and traditional banks with a digital interface. Maybe we can start with Mike and, and then go over to Everson.
Mike, maybe you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, I can touch upon kind of the U.S. regulatory environment around digital banking, and it, it really couldn't be more different. Um, I mean, there's literally thousands of banks uh, in the United States, and it's been you know very competitive for for many many years. Um, and even though uh, the regulators have tried to make it easy for new digital banks to launch, very few of them have actually launched, and very few of them um, have been able to acquire. Traditional banks, uh, very few startups are able to acquire traditional banks. So what has ended up happening is that uh, many startups uh, have started to layer um, services on top of traditional banking infrastructure. So they've, uh, in many cases, partnered with banks um, to offer a front end, but underneath the hood, there's a traditional bank that's providing the savings account. Um, and so I guess the other point I would make is just around regulation in general. It seems like uh, by its nature, no matter how um, you know well-meaning regulators are, uh, it's an industry that tends to be reactionary and incremental. And you have long periods of regulators responding to um, you know this crisis or that crisis until you get a hodgepodge of regulations that make it really impossible for any new player to enter the market. And when you get into that dynamic, you have what they call regulatory capture. Which is where you know the regulators are trying to protect consumers, but ultimately what happens is the regulated entities are kind of driving the bus, uh, and they're doing it in a way that uh, prevents competition, prevents innovation, and optimizes for their long-term profitability. Um, so it's exciting to see uh, you know deregulation or fintech-related regulations launching in many of these new markets because even though there will you know likely be some. Uh, you know, adverse credit events and other unintended consequences. I think it's ultimately a net, really net positive uh, for consumers if there's just more competition, more innovation. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Everson, while you respond, uh, there's also a question uh, which you can answer from Dave Chu, uh, who asks about digital banking and fintech ecosystem in Brazil, uh, and contrasted with that of uh, matured economies like the US. Uh, so do uh, chime in on this question as well uh, as you as you uh, comment on the oral question. Sure. Well, I would say that um, today, you know, Brazil is the most one of the most exciting places for, you know, financial innovation in the world uh, for a lot of different reasons. And uh, and we are just in the day, day one to see, you know, what's coming up to the market that's been developed over the last years. And the number one, number one thing is like, you know, it's a huge population, highly concentrated market. So it used to be that 90% of deposits were concentrated in four banks. And being that two of them are public, two of them are private. So guess what? If you want to get market share, you just need to be better than a public bank, right? But I mean, public means that they are owned by control by the government, right? So uh, it's not the most consumer centric friction, uh, uh, you know, uh, product design frictionless product design, as you can imagine. Uh, and, and you have on the other side, you know, a big population of, you know, more than 200 million population that, you know, it's a, a eager to innovation, highly mobilized uh, and highly connected across the globe, the, the, the country. And I would say that that environment emerged, you know, by, of course, the market needs uh, in terms of, you know, uh, it, it's, it's not it's not new news that you know Brazilian spreads and bank margins are one of the best in the world. Uh, you know, ranging from you know twenty five percent ROI, twenty plus ROI for like uh, over the last 20, 30 years. But the central bank is doing a, a tremendous job. is is pushing. It's being the real uh, wind force behind all the revolution here. Um, the last, uh, I would say. Uh, 15 years, they're already working on that to establish the framework that, you know, they will competition in the market on one hand by creating the right uh, approaches for new incumbents and new players, you know, to build their services, whatever you are a startup, your payment company, your, you know, a, a wallet, uh, uh, you name it. But also on the other hand, make sure that the Brazilian financial system is safe, right? That no one is going to move in money you know, on a dodgy way, uh, no one's going to move money that's not being uh, recognized by the system, right? Because ultimately, you just have 
all these uh, 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 commercial banks and, and fintechs that are ultimately plugged into the system. So they, they, they did a really good job in terms of balancing both things, right? And uh, you know, that started by you know, first regulating the payments industry, creating like a real uh, type of uh, entity for a payment company, meaning that the payment company can send and receive money and, and also collect money on behalf of third party. And, uh, and a bunch of other innovations, you know, more recently, the open bank regulation, PIX, which is the equivalent of UPI in India, right? Real time uh, payment systems. And I would say there's a, a more, you know, 10 to 20 new regulations that comes to this direction of, you know, competition, power to consumers, uh, deconcentration. And in entrepreneurial country with this vastly need, you know, that's a perfect formula for a boom in terms of innovation and, and, and opportunities in that space in Brazil. Uh, although I think uh, we are just in the early days. Um, uh, as, a, as, 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 as going to our point, you know, it's really hard. I think that one of the most hardest job to date so far, Im imagine like you are leading uh, CEO of, uh, you know, 100,000 organization that used to do business in the banking way uh, uh, of the past way, you know, with uh, that cultural DNA, legacy systems, you know, branches, uh, and then you have to like do a quick turnaround at the speed of light, you know, otherwise you're gonna be, you're gonna be, you know, uh, uh, reach out a lot of competitors on your side. That's a really tough thing to do. Uh, and uh, although some banks did a really good job in terms of kind of uh, uplifting their, you know, last mile front end experience, we know that if you don't have a real innovation on the back end in your infrastructure, as Michael was saying, telling about, you know, the crypto bank, we, are, we have one company that developed their autopilot bank that's running on the, on the blockchain as well, uh, it's really hard to compete, right? Because you have to be, you know, efficient, faster and cheaper. Uh, so I think the innovation, you know, uh, that's coming along is more verticalized, deep to the infrastructure. And what you're going to see, and I'm really looking forward to see is that, you know, ultimately that infrastructure could be global 24 per seven and will not be tied to the Brazilian uh, uh, central bank eventually, right? We'll be tied to a kind of a, uh, a global, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of type of network that we're going to have a real time register for money, all, all everything being um, audited up front, and the real time money money transfers, you know, money from me being moved at speed of light. So, and I think this is happening faster than we thought uh, that would happen, and that's very exciting. Awesome! Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Everson. So I have, a, I have three Malaysia specific audience questions that I want to quickly bang through, uh, particularly like the first one, this is for YT. Uh, so there is an anonymous uh, question here, uh, YT for you, that asks about uh, Germanic's uh, uh, application for a digital banking license, uh, whether you've gone ahead with it. I'm not sure if these applications at this time are confidential or YT, you want to make a sensational announcement, corporate announcement through this event. Uh, but Vaiti, <laughs> go ahead. I would love to get your response on this question. Great. Um, no, thanks for the question. So, uh, yeah, no, we we definitely explored it. You know, partners came to us to explore it. But ultimately, you know, our I think one of our critical success factors, you know, what really makes our business work as as a marketplace, is the fact that we are is the fact that we are a marketplace, right, and that we are impartial uh, and that we represent. You know any financial institution who wants to market their product online, um, and ultimately that that's a conflict we couldn't get across, right? So if we were to participate, if, if we were to become a digital bank, or if we were to you know join a digital bank application or consortium, then that just doesn't work for us, right? So what we found and what we believe is is the right strategy is actually to engage with everyone who's planning to become a digital bank, you know, or a digital money lender um, in Malaysia, and to work with them to you know to help them. Uh, acquire customers online to help them build a presence online right so uh, we yeah so we did take a look but ultimately there was just too much of a conflict with um, the core of our business awesome so you chose to be a switzerland of banking versus an amazon of banking <laughs> great call especially given the kind of news amazon has been having here in the us uh, great call indeed so <laughs> the next question maybe nathan you can uh, respond to this uh, the question is from uh, victor victor gan uh, do you think there are too many e-wallet players in Malaysia? 
and how can uh, e-wallet players stand out uh, while being uh, profitable uh, in a very crowded market? Sure. Um, the usual and typical answer to this will always be, yes, there's too many e-wallets. But I'm going to give a totally different answer and say, no, there aren't enough. We could do a lot more e-wallets. I will actually clarify that by saying that we do have uh, in Malaysia quite a fair bit of like maybe not so great or quite aimless e-wallets. Maybe there are those around, but that should not be any uh, um, uh, to stop. Uh, that should not stop innovation and whatnot. I say, right? I think that if you look at an example of e-wallets and do very well, I would say that e-wallets that facilitate uh, the larger ecosystem, right? So, like for example, here in Malaysia, uh, Grab, which is this ride-hailing company, is really really large over here. So then, obviously, that their e-wallet facilitates things and there's the rewards things built in and whatnot. Uh, there's a large transportation company which sends all the toll plazas over here. They are backed by N Financial, and that's a relevant e-wallet for their ecosystem. I think that another big player in uh, Malaysia today is Shopee, the e-commerce arm of uh, SEA. Uh, and they are another example whereby nobody would use a Shopee uh, e-wallet just three years ago, but today is one of the most utilized e-wallets around. Um, so to answer that question, I think we need more e-wallets actually uh, to actually open up the market. And, but these e-wallets need to be facilitating ecosystems. Uh, when you're facilitating ecosystem, then it makes a lot more sense uh, in the essence of actually adding value to the customer. And not to say e-wallets generally aren't a particularly profitable business, but it only makes sense if it's gluing together other financial services uh, as well as into a relevant and necessary ecosystem. Uh, so I'll actually answer that by we need more facilitative e-wallets, uh, but maybe not so many like aimless, like open-ended e-wallets uh, with no mandate or whatnot. I'll put it that way. Absolutely, Nathan. And the way you, you picturize it, it, it gave an Android type of picture in my mind. An e-wallet being the fintech operating system on which other apps can, can sit on, whether it's wealth management or remittance or uh, lending, borrowing, etc. etc. Uh, and therefore, that building of the developer ecosystem, building of the financial ecosystem that is the key to success uh, versus just you know endlessly trying to single-handedly differentiate yourself yeah again like usage and data usage that alone is not enough that doesn't be the ecosystem play at hand absolutely so the, the the third question which is probably for both of you uh YT and this maybe we can start with YT, is about islamic banking um, and what does uh, digital banking mean to islamic banking uh both the strengths uh, where Islamic banking can be more strongly reinforce the principles of uh, Sharia banking, as well as the weaknesses, what are the challenges uh, of following the tenets of Islamic banking for a digital bank? Why can maybe we can start with you and, and go to this now? Yeah, I'll be honest, I'm not an expert um, in Sharia finance, so I can't, uh, I can't comment in uh, I mean, I can't really make any informed comments. Um, I mean, the only thing perhaps that, you know, we can share is that um, you know out of the five new licenses, digital banking licenses that Bank Nagara is issuing, um, at least one of them will be for a Islamic digital bank. Um, but beyond that, again, I'm afraid I'm not an expert in this area. Sure. So I, I just Thanks for the kind of listen to it. Sure. Uh, just a quick one. I think that is uh, Malaysia is quite an interesting uh, financial services market when it comes to the Islamic banking side of things. We are actually fairly active in Islamic banking. Um, but I think that if you look at the traditional model whereby conventional banks, they all have their Islamic arms, it's not really spurred the Islamic industry much, right? So I think we are actually like looking for hopefully one out of the five to basically be a real Islamic specialist and actually do that market legitimately and, and properly well, rather than just being an offshoot from another conventional license. I think that would be the primary difference that we are looking to see uh, coming forward. Awesome, awesome. And, and kind of uh, as an outsider perspective, kind of my two cents on, on that question would be, um, uh, kind of my kind of understanding of Islamic banking is a lot more focused on value than time. Uh, traditional fixed income instruments and banking, they rely more on the time value of money. Time is a, a more important player than value. Um, and my understanding, my humble uh, outsider understanding of Islamic banking is that it, it emphasizes more value than time. Um, and it, it kind of doesn't support a very blind uh, time-based value uh, of assets. Um, and I feel digital banking, given the concentration of data, how closely it can track events, how closely it can track assets, uh, physical assets that are bound to financial assets uh, that is tracked by the banking system. Um, I feel this value-based uh, could be in the form of profit sharing or other forms of structures that are uh, Sharia compliant. Uh, those could be a lot more automated, a lot more efficient than done digitally, uh, than done traditionally through, through paper and, and manual supervision. Um, so my humble outsider viewpoint is that uh, Islamic banking would be a lot more efficient digitally than how it's been done traditionally. Um, 
So great. Uh, thanks. Thanks so much for your uh, quick responses. Uh, uh, there are some more questions coming in. Uh, Mike, there's a question for you. I want to just take this before moving on to the next topic. Um, does Greenweiser, uh, is it open? Uh, is your organization open to investing outside of North America region, especially in the Southeast Asian region? I think you commented on that in your introductory comments. Uh, but Mike, maybe you can elaborate more on your uh, Southeast Asia investment strategy. Yeah, we're, we're absolutely very open to investing really anywhere in the world and, and Southeast Asia in particular. Uh, two of our five partners spent a substantial, you know, more than 10 years each working in Asia. One of them, uh, Simon, you, our managing partner, actually um, covered Southeast Asia as an investment banker at Citigroup for, for many years, based out of Hong Kong, but covering Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Philippines, uh, and India. And we've, we've made one investment, uh, actually two investments in India now already. Um, and we've looked at a number of uh, other investments across other countries uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, for us as a, as a US-based investor, the bar is always higher uh, for non-US investments, just because we need to get comfortable with the uh, specific you know, regulatory overlay of that, of that country and competitive dynamics. Uh, and then uh, to the extent that it's a, um, like a, a local corporation structure, that introduces additional kind of um, you know legal complexity, but it, increasingly these days you do have uh, Southeast Asian, Indian, African companies that are setting up Delaware C corps to in increase their access to kind of the U.S. Uh, venture capital community. Thanks, Mike, and thanks uh, Dave Chu for asking the question. Um, so moving on to the next topic of our panel conversation. Uh, would love to dig a bit deeper into the customer experience aspect of digital banking. Uh, because when someone thinks of digital banking, the first thought that comes to the mind is that I don't have to go to the physical bank branch anymore. All my interactions with the bank is now going to be digital. Um, but what does that even mean, uh, especially in today's uh, you know, clutter of apps and, and multitude of digital engagement, especially driven by mobile um, and other forms of uh, uh, mobile-based access? Um, earlier, Nason mentioned about that Spanish use case where there was an Instagram uh, style of uh, engaging with a bank. Uh, so similarly, you could engage with a bank uh, through e-commerce, through the sharing economy, uh, through chat, uh, other forms of uh, video, audio type of uh, multimedia engagement. Um, uh, so for, for, but particularly, I want to start with uh, Mike and Everson. Uh, around what are some of the most innovative customer engagement experiences you have seen uh, out in uh, US and, and South America? Um, and then more to YT and Nason uh, around their thoughts on how will the customer experience evolve in Malaysia and ASEAN given the advent of digital banks? I also want the audience members to chime in on this question and, and talk about one of the all the you know kind of innovative customer experiences they've had with uh, digital banks. Uh, my two cents there. Uh, I personally uh, think of uh, iTunes as the first ever digital bank globally. Uh, what Apple did in the music industry uh, and constituted this iTunes experience where you could think of individual songs uh, as assets uh, and you could subscribe to them or, or buy them outright by, by paying a small fee. Uh, and that led to this whole iTunes uh, kind of payment experience uh, you know, more than a decade ago, which I think was truly transformational back in the day. Um, and in a way, banking uh, through music and music as an experience uh, of, uh, of uh, kind of planning how much money I want to invest in my music, uh, uh, kind of pay, may, making those payments, uh, planning how many songs you want to buy, building a playlist. Um, I feel iTunes created a music-based uh, payment and banking experience, uh, which back in those days really blew my mind. Um, but yeah, maybe we can start with uh, Everson and then Mike and then uh, have uh, YT and Nason talk about it. Sure. Um, well, I think you know, the pandemic is, is very interesting from one aspect that, you know, uh, whatever you're a consumer or you are a merchant, you have a business, you know, you have to develop your channels and your channels could be your WhatsApp, could be your e-commerce, could be your email, you know, uh, the companies have, have to adapt, you know, the way that they distribute their services and therefore how they're going to, you know, uh, exchange money in, in, with their clients and, and with their, uh, uh, you know, ecosystem. So uh, we did one, one thing that was very interesting in Brazil is that, and I think that was one of the first cases in the world that we implemented, you know, uh, a lot of capabilities in our uh, own ERP for the normal business. 
and we pretty much automatize automatize the cost of a company. We sell some goods. Uh, uh, you know, our services, our APIs, will automatically generate the billing, send to the customers, notify whatever that's gonna that when that was paid, and and do the automatic uh, reconciliation with the customer's cash flow. Everything uh, happening inside the ERP, and and the merchants and the client used to have like two, three people doing that type of uh, you know process of billing their customers through and reconcile everything's doing automatically uh, without having anyone to do it and of course you know that that un unleash a lot of uh, you know potential for these companies so this is a type of uh, uh, you know experience that is not the, th the first thing that comes to our mind you know because the first thing that comes to our mind you have you know the beautiful design, the customer flow, etc. But when you look to the operations from day to day, especially in the business, you know, uh, and we look to the business mostly because, you know, we we know how to deal with with business and and with and we like the volumes of the business, you know, in terms of of payments flow and money flow. Uh, a lot of the UX is it's, it's around process. How do you optimize this process and and makes you know uh, uh, you know friction and energy that you know the customer will put to some process disappear, right, uh, on automatic fashion. So this is being quite interesting and in, and in, in, in also the granularization of the customer outreach through messaging. I, I think is something that's quite phenomenal because you know it, ultimately the interfaces are becoming uh, conversational interfaces. And that's enabling a lot of new uh, potential for, for UX generally. Uh, so you have to be more efficient. You have to be more personalized. You have to be uh, fast. Uh, and and, and your, you know, the windows of attention of your customers are decreasing over time. So you know, as more as you do on the back end, and that can go to you know, payments conversion, uh, you know, back office conciliation, but also uh, to onboarding, you know, whatever uh, pre homework you do and before uh, interacting for merchants and transforming that in a frictionless, frictionless process uh, and in a pre automatized way, you know, I think that's that's the way to the future, you know, and uh, and this is something that, you know, to the benefit of, of uh, starting companies that, that young companies uh, who have like uh, as I mentioned, as I mentioned back, no legacy and have a talented engineer, they can do quite fast and a big, big corporations, big banks cannot do at the same speed. And of course, another important thing is being able to take the risks, right? Which is something that, uh, believe it or not, you know, a lot of the banks, they, the, the risk ratio for them to interact of these new experiences is a quite a lot. Compliance speaking, brand speaking, you know, asset speaking, they don't need to cross that level of, of uh, innovation, right, to get new customers. So they're very risk averse to test new integrations with new channels and new experiences, which I think is something as a win opportunity for all companies who want to emerge in this field. Awesome. Thanks, Everson. Uh, Mike, uh, uh, piled up on your response, there's also a question here, which I think you could uh, uh, throw light on from Sanjeev uh, around voice based interfaces to backing Alexa type interface. Um, I, I did come across a couple of startups uh, a few years back here in the Bay Area uh, who were building Alexa interfaces uh, to, to uh, for traditional kind of banking systems, especially on customer support type of use cases to engage. Uh, but Mike, uh, do also comment on the voice-based uh, interfaces along with your other comments. Sure. Uh, so actually, uh, Kamesh, your comments around your first fintech product being uh, Apple uh, and payments is a good segue into the biggest trend that we're seeing in the US fintech space. And, and that's what they call embedded fintech. Um, and the idea, the idea there is uh, early on in this fintech cycle in the last you know, five plus years, there were a number of software companies um, that were kind of sitting between a business and a consumer um, or going direct to consumer that realized that even though they were you know, not a fintech company, they were a software company, or a, or a technology company, um, they could make a lot of money by pr providing the payments themselves or providing access to credit or providing um, you know, some type of insurance. 
Uh, and so a number of companies over the last five years went through the hard work of building their own payments infrastructure and offering payments as a part of their, um, their software solution, whether it be for you know, ordering takeout food or scheduling uh, a workout at a fitness studio or you know, signing up for a class. Um, and then fast forward to today, uh, a bunch of smart developers realized that um, you know, almost any software company could arguably embed some form of FinTech product. Um, so they decided to um, make it easier for a software company to uh, introduce FinTech products. And so now uh, I've seen literally dozens of companies that are building APIs that allow a software company to embed any FinTech product you could imagine. Um, so it could be a, a lending API. So the, the startup makes it so the software provider could offer loans to a consumer or to a business without having to worry about credit underwriting, you know, funding a balance sheet, um, you know, regulatory licenses, all that is abstracted away and provided by the lending API uh, infrastructure provider. Uh, and then the software company just deals with the consumer interactions, embeds the lending experience, maybe a savings account experience, maybe a, a payments experience, uh, and then does a revenue share with the infrastructure company, uh, the, the, you know, the payments API or the lending API. And then in many cases, there's a regulated financial institution that's also part of the transaction. So there could be a, a company that provides saving, you know, savings accounts as a service, a software company that wants to offer that uh, through that API to their customers, but then under the hood, maybe Goldman Sachs is the bank that's powering those, uh, or BBVA. Um, so that's, uh, that's probably the biggest, um, you know, trend that we're seeing uh, in the US. Awesome, thanks, Mike. Uh, particularly appreciate your insights in linking banking, digital banking to the larger API economy. Um, in fact, uh, we have a portfolio company here in the US called Data Secrets, which entirely focuses on API risks and API risk management. Um, and FinTech is one of the leading kind of sources of customers and use cases, uh, especially around KYC, AML, and digitally, and the associated privacy and other types of API risks. Um, so definitely very insightful in, in looking at uh, banking, digital banking as a, as a kind of a bunch of a bag of APIs, uh, which can be embedded pretty much in, in any uh, kind of application experience, uh, including voice uh, to, to Sanjeev's earlier question uh, or a voice-based device like Alexa. Um, uh, so, so moving uh, uh, to YT and, and Nathan, uh, uh, would love to hear uh, kind of your thoughts on as, as digital banking emerges uh, in Southeast Asia uh, and, and your kind of insights into consumer behavior, especially the younger Gen Z and millennial generation. Uh, what do you expect as uh, kind of emerging popular interfaces to, to banking? Um, there have also been a couple of related questions, uh, one around uh, user acquisition cost. Um, and, and whether digital banking uh, reduces the uh, acquisition cost of acquiring a, a banking customer. Um, and, uh, and, and also, I also want to pile up another question, uh, more from a regulatory standpoint, uh, particularly given the announcements from the central bank uh, a few months back. Um, has the central bank done anything particularly to reduce the documentation uh, kind of overhead in, in opening up accounts or, or going through more complex transactions? Uh, particularly around AML, KYC, that type of, uh, usually that document overhead uh, stands as a friction point uh, for smooth digitization of banking transactions. Uh, so we'd love to hear your comments and your observations uh, given the central bank's announcements so far in Malaysia. Um, so, so maybe we can start with Nason and, and then have a uh, weekly comment. Sure, sure. Um, I also like uh, maybe what doing my answer. I also take on uh, Ellen's uh, question about wholesale banking as well, since that's uh, particularly okay. relevant to me as well. So I think when people look at the young generation as well, I would not like to exclude young businesses as well, because there's actually a lot of uh, the kind of like businesses that my company Money Match serves here in Malaysia, a lot of startups. Uh, and like one sector I like to talk about that really excites us is actually about e-commerce. So during this global pandemic, over the past couple of years, e-commerce has, has been boom town. Right? It's been booming like insane levels over here uh, in Southeast Asia and in Malaysia as well. Uh, uh, these are guys at Lazada and Shopee. And we actually see a massive surge, a massive growth of 
young guys, when I say young means that they're, they're graduated or they're in their 20s or in their 30s, going out of their way, maybe they lost their jobs in the travel segment, they're going out to starting new e-commerce businesses, right? And they actually start doing quite well. They do drop shipping, they do e-commerce, they start earning good money. And yet, they are unable to access any form of banking services. Right? Why? Because banks will never give a, a small e-commerce company. You don't have two years of audited statements. There are so many minimum barriers that these young e-commerce companies can get. So even these young e-commerce companies run by young guys are actually being left out completely. And this is something that's a lot more relevant to us as well. I think that for MoneyMatch, we actually serve a lot of the SMEs and startups over here. And we hope to actually bring into the digital banking consortium that whole re- uh, wholesale aspect to it as well. Uh, one easy aspect is just looking at straightforward working capital provisions, or even things like invoice financing for the e-commerce sector, it's really, really underserved. Uh, and traditional banks just aren't able to have their credit assessment models around drop shipping models and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's something that's really, really exciting, uh, building SME-relevant products to young companies uh, who are very much more open to this uh, new age of financial services. Awesome. Thanks, Nathan. Whitey? Let me take the uh, the audience question first. So is let me just read out the question. Um, is cost is user acquisition cheaper and easier in emerging versus matured markets? Um, I, I maybe just give a kind of a strange answer to this, which is you think about customer acquisition for say a bank in an emerging market versus the traditional market. Well, one of the biggest differences is that in an emerging market, say anywhere in Southeast Asia, apart from say Singapore. Um, you know, labor is, is, is relatively cheap. So it's, it's actually not that expensive for you know, banks to have very, very large sales teams to go out and acquire customers for credit cards, personal loans, and mortgages. Um, and that's just not something you see in a developed market like, say, the US or UK or around Europe, um, largely just because it's just too expensive, right? It's the, the cost of, of running a sales team is just too high to justify. Um, so I think that's that's one of the things that makes that just you know, developed versus emerging markets very different. Not just when it comes to you know, where technology is, but you know, when you think about you know, when banks think about the, the options they have when it comes to how to acquire customers, um, the difference in labor cost uh, can make a, a huge difference in terms of what what they do. Um, you know, on your question about kind of user interfaces, uh, I, think they, I think one of the most interesting things which I think we've seen more in well, I think you've definitely seen it out of China. You've seen you've seen it out of Indonesia, is how you know basically the the largest and most disruptive fintechs um, have typically been spun out of or, or kind of have grown off um, another ecosystem, right? So in in China, you know, Ant uh, Ant grew out of the Alibaba ecosystem. You know, in in Indonesia, you have uh, the, the I mean, Gojek has a whole suite of financial services, right, which essentially came out of the, the ride hailing platform and similarly you know grab uh, grab have they've got grab pay across the region they've got a digital banking license um, in Singapore and I suppose the question is you know why does that happen I think Mike touched on this right which is if if you you know it, it, when you make it just so seamless and easy for a consumer to to access a financial service um, from another digital service they're using um, when you remove that barrier of having to speak to people and fill out forms, um, it just becomes very easy, right, for for other in, you know other large digital ecosystems to build um, financial services off that. And I believe that's what we're going to see across Southeast Asia, right? You, know, you have um, you know, Shopee, for example, uh, they have with the largest e-commerce player in the region. Uh, they've got a digital banking license in Singapore. They've acquired a bank in, in Indonesia. Um, so I think that's you know the the fact that these very successful you know, non-financial services, uh, digital ecosystems are, are adding financial services to them. That's probably where you'll see some of the, the, the most serious kind of, uh, the most scalable disruption um, and growth in new services. Awesome, thanks, thanks, Vaiti. Um, so I, I'd like to move to the next topic that we have planned to talk about, which is around credit risk uh, and the stability of banking and what does digital do uh, in, in contributing to better, stabler, more inclusive, more sustainable uh, banking systems. Um, it also relates to a question that uh, Watson had asked uh, uh, some time ago uh, around would traditional banks eventually get completely replaced by digital banks or would they continue to coexist? Um, I personally feel the answer to this question 
is around uh, can digital banks provide better shareholder value compared to the shareholder value the traditional banks have provided if that is the case it's a it's a case to be made that eventually traditional banks will morph into completely digital banks just because it provides better shareholder value uh, and obviously there's a lot of incentive for doing that in, in any open market system uh, unless there is some regulatory constraint that there has to be certain volume of traditional banking in a, in a given kind of banking system um, this also relates to the aftermath of the 2008 crisis especially in the us uh, you know with the dot frank and other kind of regulatory systems um, that impose new constraints on the way particularly lending and credit uh, can be operated especially in large banks um, in my opinion that led to a flurry of new startups like lending club and cabbage and, and the other kind of companies that came out of the 2008 crisis um, because they saw an opportunity because of the constraints that traditional big banks, the big bulge, uh, had as a, as a consequence of the bailout and the dot Frank Act. Um, so I so would love to uh, hear uh, the panelists' view uh, both ways. You know, uh, what makes you think digital banks can provide better shareholder value um, and, or uh, contrarian-wise, uh, what makes you think we will definitely still continue to have traditional banks uh, while the uh, digital banks grow? Um, so maybe we can we can start with uh, Everson and Mike, uh, and then uh, move to Nason and and Whitey. Um, Everson, you want to go first? Sure. Um, yeah. I, I mean, uh, I think uh, there's a there's not a universal response for that because if you look, um, you know, at least in the, in the Brazilian market, we have a very strongly this concept of universal banking. Right, where you have a big uh, banking conglomerates that have all the products you can imagine, you know, from wholesale, retail, insurance, credit, you know, consumer, business. And I think life for this type of organization can be really tough going forward because you have very focused niche players really specialized in, in deploying one services in the market in, the, in a great fashion, you know, and, and be 100% focused on, on improve that. And, and we are starting to see that happening now in the market in, in a very fragmented ways, right? And, uh, and it's tough for, for I would say, the, the incumbents because they have to choose their fights, right? Um, and, and, uh, and especially that, you know, as was, was mentioned before, you know, the level of competition is not coming from banks, but coming from retail, coming from supply chain, you know, coming from everyone who has a data knowledge for their customer base that can transform that in the distribution of financial services, as Michael was saying before. Uh, but you have you have uh, one aspect of this conversation, you know, which is services, right? The other aspect of this conversation, which is balance sheet. Right. And, and, the, and the balance sheet conversation is, is, is a little bit more different, right? Because, you know, one of the big advantages of the big banks nowadays is the, is the, the scale of their balance sheet, right? Uh, and, uh, in, in, and if you want to go to wholesale, big contrast, big lending, you know, uh, balance sheet uh, speaks volumes around that. Uh, so I would say that, you know, in services, uh, you know, the competition will be very, very, very tough and, 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 and the beneficial for that uh, in the end is consumers and clients. But on the lending space, you know, uh, of course, uh, uh, as you grow from the chain in terms of uh, amount at risk, I think balance sheet will be preserved somehow. But, uh, but again, you know, things are changing very fast. And, and if you see the speed of innovations we are seeing on DeFi, uh, on you know the whole crypto space, you know a lot of emerging solutions that are coming there can uh, you know transform these industries and these these verticals really fast as well. So it's a, I think it's gonna, we're we're going to see a fantastic ten, 10 years ahead of us. Uh, you know uh, uh, that will be explosion of innovation between technology and the financial industry. You know it, it's just starting. Awesome, thanks, Everson. Uh, Mike, you want to go next? Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to make sure I know the two questions. The first is around kind of shareholder value um, of digital banks versus traditional banks. What was the second question? So therefore, where do we expect the distribution to be? Will digital banks completely displace traditional banks? Or is there going to be an ideal kind of golden ratio of uh, digital versus yeah. traditional? Okay. Uh, so I think it's interesting to watch 
what traditional institutions like uh, Goldman Sachs are doing. I mean, they've gone uh, heavily into uh, you know digital banking initiatives, but also partnering with fintechs. Um, you know, being part of the Apple Card program, um, working with Stripe. Um, so I think the traditional banks that are successful, that are the most successful, will do some combination of you know, launching their own innovative digital banking products, but also understanding that um, the best innovation is likely to come from de novo startups and figuring out ways to partner with and ride the coattails uh, and the growth of those types of startups. Um, so I, I do think that if you look across the landscape of traditional banks in the US, um, most of them are not gonna figure out um, how to um, how to adopt these types of strategies. They're going to launch, you know, secondhand, not as good digital banking products because they can't uh, attract the developers to build best in class products. And because they can't navigate, navigate their current regulatory complexity and tech stack to get best in class products out there. Um, and so most banks are going to fall behind. Um, they have customers now and they'll just be faced with uh, declining growth to flat um, to flat revenue, uh, and you'll have some level of consolidation uh, within those companies that um, you know can't really drive growth. And then you'll have uh, another set of uh, traditional financial institutions who are able to embrace uh, you know launching their own digital products, but probably more importantly, figuring out how to partner with fintech companies to be part of these you know lending API um, solutions solutions or strategies, payments API, how can they be part of those ecosystem plays? Um, and so I, so I do think, you know, any new uh, younger generation person coming into the market, it, they're going to want an experience more like Robinhood, more like Chime, or more like a firm where they're buying a product and they're getting a loan without even really realizing it's a loan and it's, it's a subscription payment product. Um, so I do think that the lion's share of anybody uh, in the younger generation is going to adopt those types of products. Uh, traditional banks will be left out, except for those that are able to kind of um, thread the needle and, and partner with fintech firms. Absolutely. Very, very interesting response. And combining your comments with ever since, it almost looks like there's going to be an economy of engagement uh, where startups are going to play the lead role uh, and be very, very interesting embedded uh, engagement workflows uh, and APIs that can embed those engagements in whatever types of experiences they want to focus on. Um, and behind this uh, economy of engagement, there's going to emerge an economy of scale that Everson was highlighting, uh, where the big balance sheets uh, are still going to continue to have their value uh, in terms of uh, regulatory compliance, in terms of uh, uh, liquidity, in terms of uh, uh, kind of capital scale. Um, and maybe there, the traditional banks will continue to have their uh, kind of power, uh, their influence on regulators, uh, their influence on uh, liquidity and, and so on and so forth. Um, and, and to your earlier com uh, comments, Mike, uh, there is going to be an API type of engagement layer between the economy of uh, engagement and the economy of scale. Um, that's a fascinating way of looking at uh, the future of digital banking um, and, and almost looking at it as kind of two layers uh, of, of evolution uh, that are going to evolve in, in lockstep with each other. Uh, it also reminds me of the way the reinsurance industry has evolved uh, over the perhaps the last century uh, with primary with uh, distributors and brokers, primary carriers and reinsurers. Uh, it almost looks like uh, there is a possibility of the banking industry moving in the direction of the insurance value chain um, and, and creating uh, in parallel both economies of engagement and economies of scale. Uh, thanks. Fa very, very fascinating comments. That, um, that's so, a way to package, Kamesh. I really like it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, Vaiti and Nathan, especially as you see the commentary from the central bank and other regulators, um, uh, how are you kind of seeing uh, the, the, uh, are the, is the central bank uh, clamping down the digital banks uh, as far as they do with traditional banks? Uh, or are you seeing some kind of a, uh, 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 honeymoon period or a, a lower regulatory period to just encourage uh, the growth and evolution of uh, young and new digital banks. Um, I would love to hear your comments on what you're seeing uh, out there in Asia. Uh, maybe we can start with Nathan and then 
go over to my team. I think. Um, yeah, so I think that like uh, to first off answer the, the, the question, uh, it's a big no for me. I don't think uh, digital banks will overtake and replace um, traditional banks anytime so soon. A uh, simple example of that is like, just a simple case here in Malaysia, uh, the largest bank here in Malaysia, it's about 100 million Malaysian dollars capitalization. Uh, the current regulation for digital banks at the moment is for 3 billion ringgit. So that's like 33 times over, right? So um, being a former banker myself and all that, the banks do a lot of stuff. They do structured trade finance. They do like multinational payrolls for all the guests. I mean, there's a lot of aspects to uh, big size uh, banking that will, that will not be covered so easily by digital banks. But I will say then on the other side that uh, traditional banks need to be really aware of actually the retail market. That's actually the biggest disruption factors. Uh, so answer a bit of like Sanjeev's question as well about like banking uh, questionable practices in, in China as well. Um, well, I think that because of that as well, I think regulators both Singapore and Malaysia as well, and we expect future regulators in Thailand and Indonesia to be thoroughly addressing that to limitations of the capital and the limitations of services that you can do. So I think those are like good lessons that's already been learned. And then the lessons from Australia, then you get like sustainability requirements. Uh, but end of the day, from a bigger perspective of things as well, I think that uh, YT actually made a very good comment whereby some of really, really big conglomerates actually coming into this game not just like you know a small little startup uh some of these guys are actually i think like uh c itself um it, when they are singapore public listed something like 100 billion singapore dollars something like that which is almost three times the size of the largest bank in malaysia and they're going for a banking license right and they've already bought one in indonesia they've already applied in singapore they're definitely coming over here and other countries so i would say that the traditional banks need to be a little bit mindful these are very very well backed a huge e-commerce companies, huge tech companies, and gaming companies, and all that, which are coming in to really snipe away at the entire user base, uh, younger user base. But on the wholesale side, I guess a lot of the innovation is more still focused on the SME side, and not so much on the larger scale, uh, medium or large enterprises. So there's still very much big games to be played out uh, by the banks and profitable side of things as well. Awesome. Uh, it's a very well-balanced uh, response. Uh, so it looks like nobody has a clear advantage. Everybody has to figure their way out and play to their advantages. Uh, Why uh, eager to hear your comments as well. well so many questions. Um, I, I think just to touch briefly on, on, on the question around regulations, uh, I think Nation, Nation already mentioned, you know, I, I don't believe, and, and bank, when you look at the new regu draft regulations for digital banks, um, I mean, there's no regulatory arbitrage, right? Uh, they are allowing, obviously, they are making space for new digital banks to play. Um, I think probably the biggest concession for the new players is is uh, the new the biggest concession for new players will be the fact that you can enter with a, a smaller amount of capital, right? You don't need as much capital to start uh, a digital bank as you would for a traditional bank, um, but otherwise the, the, the governance, compliance, etc., will be will be very similar. Um, so no 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 advantages there. Um, I mean, on the other question around, sorry, my kids are screaming in the background. Um, you know, the other question around. You know, will digital banks replace traditional banks? I, I think you'll see. Kind of, I, I believe it'll play out very similarly to industries such as you, know, you look at newspapers, right? Where um, you you've had the industry completely turned upside down by digitization, um, but some some of the traditional players have thrived, and, and you know, and some have have, have failed. Uh, and at the same time, you've had new digital players come in. So ultimately, it's going to come down to on a case by case basis, right? Is the board of each particular bank are they willing to, to make the investments? Are they willing to cannibalize their own business um, to prepare for the future? Awesome, thanks. Thanks, YT. Uh, so maybe we can move on to the uh, final segment of our conversation um, and particularly throw a spotlight on the role of data, AI, technology uh, in this kind of new form, new style of uh, digital banking. Um, so traditional uh, banking organizations involved uh, IT system type of backend uh, and a lot of uh, human discussion, human uh, expertise based uh, processes, uh, whether it's around uh, origination or uh, credit decision making or risk selection, um, or even you know, just customer engagement, uh, especially for high net worth type of customers uh, on the wealth management side. Um, uh, but the notion of digital banking uh, gives the possibility of an entirely different type of uh, technology and system stack, uh, which is driven uh, more by data, AI, uh, uh, you know, cloud, uh, software as a service, APIs, like Mike was pointing out earlier. Um, and therefore, we can start imagining a, a banking system stack that looks more like uh, an Amazon or, or a Google or a Facebook uh, than a, a traditional bank uh, in itself. 
Um, uh, and, and this obviously has far reaching consequences everywhere. Of course, one on the customer engagement side, which we discussed earlier, uh, but also on uh, decision making side, especially risk underwriting side. Uh, do we expect risk underwriting to get uh, significantly transformed uh, with a very different type of tech architecture? Uh, or do we still see remnants of traditional risk underwriting, uh, but with just a digital kind of interface to it? Uh, it also has far-reaching consequences around fraud uh, and other forms of risk management. Uh, of course, fraud analytics, fraud detection has always been, perhaps in my opinion, the most technical branch of a, of a bank. Um, uh, but uh, presumably digital banking can put uh, fraud detection and risk management on steroids, uh, given the uh, intrusiveness of uh, apps and APIs and interfaces and the richness of data and the analytics that can be driven on top of that and the real-time nature of that. Um, so I so would love to hear uh, the panelists' uh, views, opinions uh, on, on the uh, transformation of the system, the banking system stack, uh, given uh, the role of digital banks, uh, rollout of digital banks, and of course, broader uh, applicability of data and AI. Um, so, so maybe we can we can start with uh, uh, Mike and Everson. Um, Everson, I'm sure, has a hands-on view on this topic, uh, having <laughs> know, built a digital bank and, and run it as a business. Um, and I'm sure even uh, uh, you know uh, uh, YT and and Nathan, I'm sure you're doing a lot of AI and data-driven uh, enablement on the backend side, even with your current uh, kind of products and and system stacks. Uh, would love to hear your thoughts on. Uh, how are the emerging digital banks in Malaysia thinking about uh, the technology and the backend architecture around it? Uh, so maybe we can start with Mike and, and then Everson and then uh, move to YT and, and this. Uh, Mike, you want to go first? Sure. Uh, yeah, so one of the core themes of our fund is that we're looking to back platform business models that are leveraging what we call predictive applications to deliver real-time insights to customers. Um, and by predictive applications, we effectively mean leveraging, you know, huge data sets and all these modern tools like, you know, APIs to push and pull data from other applications, machine learning, NLP, and to really deliver, um, you know, nuggets of information or insights or uh, offers or rewards or whatever it might be that are highly relevant to the, to the user or the customer, much like you would see on Netflix or, or Amazon. And when we say platforms, um, you know, payments companies are a perfect example with Stripe being the most successful. They're, they're sitting between, you know, traditional financial institutions, um, merchants, and consumers, uh, and, in, and in many cases, also a marketplace provider. And so they're capturing data from all these different uh, counterparties, uh, and that allows them to uh, do things like deliver uh, better fraud solutions or uh, provide, you know, credit to their uh, customers. And so we're, we're really looking to back companies that have some platform element and that they're sitting between uh, multiple parties in a transaction. And that gives them some type of uh, data advantage plus uh, kind of a, a customer that they can push uh, multiple financial services products to. And then they've built their, uh, their you know, technology on modern, you know, with modern data architecture that allows them to deliver these types of insights. Then if you go to the traditional financial institutions, you know, many of them are LPs of ours uh, and the way their financial systems were uh, architected, it's entirely in you know, silos. So even within one bank, uh, their systems are you know, more often than not communicating with each other. So if you got a mortgage, that's one part of the bank, but then if you have a savings account, that's another part of the bank. Uh, and you know, if you're applying for maybe an unsecured consumer loan, it's not easy for them to pull the, the data from the mortgage part of the bank and the savings account part of the bank. You still need to re-input all that data. And then if you get into pulling data from external you know, applications or software providers, then it's, it's a complete impossibility. Um, you know, so we, we do ultimately think that the companies that win uh, within the FinTech ecosystem will be you know, leveraging some form of platform strategy where they're capturing data from you know, multiple different counterparties to a transaction, improving outcomes for all those parties. Uh, and then they've built their uh, data architecture in a way where they can you know, tag, clean, integrate with external APIs uh, and deliver real-time insights to their customers. Awesome, thanks. Thanks, Mike. 
Jefferson. Uh, particularly, I would love to hear your hands-on experience building the stack and what you felt was uh, disruptively different than a traditional banking stack. Yeah, uh, everything. <laughs> uh, and actually, my partner, Rodrigo, is a co-founder of the Hive and CTO. He was just fighting with me for the whole month about the scope of the of the project, right? Say, you know, it's a we are building a retail bank on the cloud with everything on API based uh, that will ultimately be around ten to fifteen services from you know send money, take money, issue a card, uh, issue a bank slip, uh, you know, uh, discount receivables, you name it. So, and we are just able to do because we have one repository of data, right? Um, and of course, we are able to build this uh, ETL, you know, the extract, transform, and load data process from scratch, designed it for, you know, for AI. And then most of the services you know, that incumbents use, we're not, we're not designed to AI. We're not designed to do data manipulation at scale, right? So, that was a very critical element of doing in, 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 in the architecture. And, uh, and the second one is making the, all, the, all the, the services are kind of API driven microservices. So you can, you can just adapt and, and, and integrate them with your applications uh, in a very modular, you know, flexible way, right? So when you have the benefit of scale, but also have the benefit of uh, flexibility, which is usually hard things to combine, right? Because in our visions that you don't know how and, and when this, this, in which context this service will be consumed, right? So you have to have an API to make sure that whatever the, this application, this service will be consumed in whatever context, it will work and it will be adaptable and you don't have to broke out all your backend infrastructure to serve that, right? Uh, it will work fine. Uh, and um, generally speaking, I would say that, you know, it's a it's a it's a it's a really nice party if you want to just rub the whole banking, uh, uh, you know, from technology technology perspective, architectural perspective, and, and and process design perspective, right? Because ultimately, if you look for for the for the end, you know, let's let's look at banks as a databases. They are uh, asynchronous databases, right? Uh, with a lot of databases inside the whole the one organization, they are not they are not uh, updated in real time. They not interact uh, in, 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 in a fast way, um, and uh, and uh, and ultimately, if you look, what is a bank? Was a fintech is a number on a database, right? And 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 why? when we look database nowadays, you know, you have database in the cloud, real time, interconnected, you know. Uh, and uh, so for, for the backend point of view, you know, and that's why I think blockchain has a, has a huge potential, not just blockchain, but I'd say like uh, the protocol for trust and, 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 uh, and transactions has a more potential because ultimately uh, banks nowadays are legacy old type of databases, right? So just for the database innovation, you have a huge opportunity. But when you go to the business, you know, ultimately it just beats right? You don't have atoms. It's all about process, right? Whatever you're doing in the financial services is all about process. Onboarding is about process. QIC is about process. Credit uh, and, and lending on the right is about process, you know? Service is about process. Account manager is about process. Cash manager is about process, you know? It's all about process. So that's the dream if you want to create a kind of a, at least there's a common vision that we have all across the hive, you know? the uh, uh, autonomous enterprise using a lot of uh, uh, robotic process automation, intelligence process automations to do really thinking about this process and see how you can fully automatize that as much as, as much as you can and leverage data to make this process intelligent and frictionless for the customers. So uh, I think that it's a, it's a huge opportunity, huge opportunity. And uh, even though if you're incumbent and you want to redesign that inside the organization, it's going to be a nightmare. Right, but by taking the advantage to do that on the, this new uh, infrastructure, meaning database, robotic process automation, all the process, you know, I think that's a by design a, a very powerful economic advantage because your cost of servicing the customer 
be much cheaper than the other player in the market, you know, because you're leveraging all the technologies you have nowadays to to and, and passing that efficiency to the customer in form of experience and price, right? So that 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 you know, uh, we took us and took us a year to put the whole uh, charter uh, to work uh, connected with Brazilian financial system with a full retail uh, uh, offering uh, in terms of products uh, and in the cloud. So uh, I bet if we're doing the old type of legacy architecture, it will take you uh, more time and be more, way more costly. Awesome. Thanks, Avastan. I particularly like your uh, tagline, uh, digital banking is a technological party. Uh, I think that sums it up very well. And thanks for the shout out to our colleague Rodrigo as well and his uh, role in shaping up the new architecture. Um, so I, we have about uh, six minutes left, uh, but we'd love to hear comments from both uh, YT and Nason. Uh, particularly, there's a question from Dave Chu uh, around the FinTech talent gap in Southeast Asia. Uh, I'm sure you, you would have already faced that even without digital banking and hiring and growing your respective organizations. Um, uh, I call it the economies of talent, uh, which is more foundational than even the other two I mentioned earlier, whether it's economies of engagement or uh, scale, balance sheet scale. Uh, so maybe Vaite, we can start with you and, and then have uh, uh, Nisman also comment on this one. Sure, I mean, just on the talent gap, I think um, you know, we, we need to be realistic, right? And, uh, about what we want to achieve and, and you know what's available to us. I think you know Patrick Grove, who's arguably one of the most successful uh, tech entrepreneurs right, in the region, has said many times, right, that you know he, he's not he, he's not trying to do the same things in Southeast Asia as a Silicon Valley company would do, right. So when you think about fintech in particular, um, you know one area where it, I think it's almost impossible to compete with a country like China, right, when those when those companies coming into Southeast Asia is is AI. Right, so that we that we just do not have the same depth and breadth of uh, data science capabilities, um, and you know, if if you ignore that, you know, it's probably going to you're probably going to have to pay for it. Um, I mean, on on the previous question, I think you know, Emerson summed it up really nicely, and you know, in terms of just how difficult it is for a traditional bank right to digitize it, and we've seen this firsthand. Um, and I think the, the easiest way I try and think about it. Uh, and we you know we've learned this the hard way working with banks is that you know traditional bank technology uh, is is built for stability and scalability and security, right? And it has typically it has zero flexibility. So when you don't even talk about AI and use of data, um, you know, traditional banking uh, technologies. So for example, like a loan origination system, a lot of the loan origination systems that are still being used today, they can't even change the order in which data is inputted for an application. Right, don't even talk about using alternative types of data. Um, and what we've seen uh, many banks do is that it's you know it's, it, it, they found it's actually cheaper to build a new system, right, to go with a new vendor than it is to try and upgrade their old systems. But again, to Emerson's point, um, it's it's extremely disruptive. It's quite it's very painful. It takes a long time, um, but they have to do it. Right, and if they don't do it, then they will. You know, I believe the banks that you know, don't make these investments and don't make these changes. Um, there's no way they can hold on to the customers in the next five to ten years, right? Because with the new, with the new digital banks, with the new fintechs coming online, um, you know the customer experience, the product value propositions will be so much better. You know, with digital first uh, banks, that the traditional guys, uh, you know, they'll be forced to innovate or they'll uh, essentially be competed away. Awesome, thanks, thanks, Vicky. Uh, Nathan, uh, we have limited time, but uh, very good sure. to hear your comments. <laughs> Sure, so sure. just to wrap things up, uh, basically, I mean, the role of data, AI, and tech, is, it's all about opportunity, right? Um, I'm not too sure about in the US, where I assume maybe the banks are more advanced, but over here in Southeast Asia, uh, most of the traditional banks, echoing what YT just said, have a lot of legacy infrastructure, codes within 30, 40 years ago, project managers have changed 10 times since, CEOs have changed five times since over the last 20 years. So it's all typical traditional bureaucratic problems, but it's fantastic in terms of the opportunity that it gives for uh, people like ourselves, fintechs and ourselves, to actually use real life uh, data analytics, things that the banks are even aware of, but they can't even move to do due to their legacy infrastructure. Uh, but like, is there examples like things that we do on the blockchain, uh, moving cross border payments out there, much faster than banks, or even things like data analytics for invoice lending as well, which banks just don't do because they just don't have the infrastructure for it. So it's all about opportunity, uh, and the role of, of data and AI really, really makes it uh, a lot more exciting for us, uh, fintechs in the space. Thanks. Awesome. On that cheerful note, I'm really grateful to all you guys. I think we had an amazing conversation. A lot of very active kind of audience interaction. 
shout out to the audience as well for doing that. Uh, particular shout out to Everson, uh, he's way past midnight, uh, but <laughs> very cheerful, very active, very insightful in uh, leading this conversation. Uh, also, Mike, uh, thanks a lot for staying up late uh, and, and making this event such a grand success. Uh, of course, YT, Mason, uh, thanks a lot for bringing, bringing to us such deep insights uh, about the Malaysian ASEAN economy, uh, patterns in, in consumer and customer behavior. I'm sure all our uh, audience members are much more informed, much more knowledgeable uh, about this very important part of the global economy. Um, so I'll, I'll hand it back to Matty uh, for her closing comments. Uh, and again, thank you all. And I thoroughly enjoyed uh, this discussion. I'll jump in before Matty. Thanks, Kamesh, for, for the energy that you brought into the moderation. And, and in addition to Everson, Heizem and Sharil for, for helping put this together. And of course, Matty for all the hard work that got, uh, was put into doing this. Matty? Well, we couldn't do this without you guys at home. So thank you all so much, wherever you are, whether it's morning, afternoon, or the middle of the night. And thanks so much to our speakers. I learned so much. I hope you guys did too. Please go ahead and subscribe to The Hive Think Tank and you will get this recording emailed to you tomorrow. So share with your friends and your colleagues who couldn't make it. Thanks guys. We'll catch you next time. Bye. -bye.